It is our pleasure to introduce CNN's Richard Quest, the moderator of the plenary session. I'm so glad that that video had the last bit about how things have got better and what we are doing, because if we'd left it just at the beginning, we really would have been in a very difficult environment completely. But what we see here today is the first Astana International Forum. Now, we have met before here. We've met under the different guise of the Economic Forum. But as that video made clear, no, and I think as everybody in this room will accept, we can no longer divorce economic activity from the real world of foreign policy, climate change, and international development. And that is why this event, Mr. President, Thank you, sir. Thank you for recognizing that a well-known institution, the Economic Forum, had to widen its brief and had to start including these wider issues. Otherwise, we were in silos. And Mr. President, thank you, sir, for hosting us and bringing together this remarkable group of leaders. Um, may I acknowledge our guest of honor today, uh, guest of honors, His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, the Emir of Qatar. Sir, you are most welcome. Thank you for being here. His Excellency, the President of Kyrgyzstan, sir, you are most welcome. And we are delighted and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And Her Excellency, the Chair of the Presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Ma'am, we are looking forward to hearing you uh, and getting your perspective and talking to you. All right. I want you to look at these words before we get started. I want you to look at these words. Tackling challenges through dialogue. And that is the crucial part, because everybody here knows full well the challenges. You don't get a prize for restating what we already know. We know how much trouble we are in. The issue is how we get out of it. And that's the next bit, dialogue towards cooperation, development, progress. And so, and I hope the president will agree, talk to each other. Be blunt, put on the table what your problem is, and then look around to the people who are with you, who have been brought here, who can help together solve it. And with that in mind, may I respectfully and with privilege invite the President of Kazakhstan to do the opening address. Mr. President, thank you for bringing us here. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Astana International Forum. We are joined by friends and colleagues from every continent and, and from the worlds of government, diplomacy, business, and academia. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our special guests the Amir of Qatar, the President of Kyrgyzstan, the Chairwoman of the Presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Prime Minister of Uzbekistan, and other distinguished participants. We are honored by your personal commitment to, co to come here and join us in what we hope 
will be a fruitful exchange of views on the current state of global economic affairs and issues of regional cooperation. We believe this is one way of giving expression to a true sense of international partnership. As we begin this forum, let me also extend my sincere appreciations to our strategic partner, the United Nations, and its organizations, including the IMF, UNESCO, UNDP, WTO, ESCAP, and other international institutions, as well as our media partner, CNN. Dear participants, the Astana International Forum is a dialogue platform with a mission. First, to candidly review the global situation. Second, to identify the leading challenges and crises that confront us. Third, to tackle those challenges through dialogue in a spirit of mutual cooperation. Fourth, to renew and rebuild a common culture of multilateralism. And fifth, to amplify voices for peace, progress, and solidarity. The forum explicitly promotes greater engagement at a time when we need it more than ever, a period of unprecedented geopolitical tension. For it to survive, the global system must work for, for everyone, promoting peace and prosperity for the many rather than for the few. Dear friends, we are witnessing the process of eroding of very foundation of the world order that has been built since the creation of the United Nations. The United Nations remains to be the only universal global organization which unites all together. Meanwhile, we will not succeed in tackling these challenges in absence of a comprehensive reform of the Security Council. The voices of middle powers in the Council need to be amplified and clearly heard. A handful of recent new crises from COVID-19 to armed conflicts threaten our fragile international ecosystem. Yet, the roots of this dislocation run deeper in our past. We are also witnessing the return of earlier divisive bloc mentalities unseen for 30 years. The, the forces of division are not purely geopolitical. They are also motivated by economic undercurrents. Economic policy itself is openly weaponized. These confrontations include sanctions and trade wars, targeted debt policies, reduced access or exclusion from financing and investment screening. Together, these factors are gradually undermining the foundation upon which rests the global peace and prosperity of recent decades, free trade, global investment, innovation, and fair competition. This, in turn, fuels social unrest and division within states and tensions between them, widening gaps in culture and values. All these trends have become existential threats Efforts to reverse this tide are more difficult because of widespread disinformation, which is now becoming even more advanced and dangerous. In parallel, new technologies, from artificial intelligence to biotechnologies, have global implications but are being addressed along narrow national lines only. Together, these pressures are pushing the globalized world order to a breaking point. The result is growing mistrust, which puts negative impact on functioning 
of prominent international fora, existing frameworks, security regimes, and non-proliferation mechanisms. Therefore, we face uncertainty, greater instability, and conflict. This, in turn, prompts greater defense spending on advanced weaponry, which ultimately guarantees nothing. The proof, for the first time in a half century, we have faced the prospect of the use of nuclear weapons. All this comes at precisely the moment when we urgently need to be focusing on the existential threat of climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, the fundamental point is, just as a combination of geopolitical pressures are pushing us apart, we face a clear, strong imperative to come together, to engage, to collaborate, and to align with one, with one another. At such a time, the Astana International Forum is one of many possible steps to reverse this trend. Only by meeting together, taking counsel together, being mutually honest about our problems, our concerns, and our hopes, the international, can the international community address these issues. Only this way can we shape our shared future and return to the gradual building of a more stable, equitable, and prosperous world for all. Dear friends, Kazakhstan has long been a crossroad between East and West, North and South. In many ways, this forum is consistent with the culture and history of the great Eurasian steppe. We take pride in this heritage. It is from this continuous exchange of goods, cultures, and ideas that Kazakhstan's unique national identity and its particular brand of multilateralism have emerged. Despite geopolitical upheavals, Kazakhstan keeps serving as an economic engine in and for Central Asia. We continue to attract significant foreign investment and provide exceptional conditions to do business in Kazakhstan. At the same time, we hope for a sense of mutual responsibility from our foreign partners. This is our basic policy. This in turn creates equal rights and opportunities for small and medium enterprises that are very instrumental for economic development of my country. Last year, Kazakhstan's exports increased by almost 40%, while a significant proportion of our GDP still comes from the energy sector. Our drive towards diversification is accelerating. We are seeing growth across diverse sectors like automotive, pharmaceuticals, processed metals, and mechanical engineering. We invite all of you who wish to explore new avenues for business and economic partnership with us. For example, the Middle Corridor or Trans-Caspian International Transport Route linking China to the European Union is opening up new possibilities for trade and investment. The route will cut almost in half the time it takes to transport goods via the Indian Ocean. I would also like to emphasize the key role of Kazakhstan in the Belt and Road Initiative, which promotes economic development and intra-regional connectivity. We aim to foster physical connection among the nations and people present here today, but also to nurture bonds between our con com communities as partners and friends. Given all these factors, we can now say that Kazakhstan is a truly global and most importantly, reliable trade and economic partner. Ladies and gentlemen, my country has always worked hard to contribute to international peace and security. We are strong proponents of nuclear disarmament 
and commitment to NPT. Our country initiated the Astana peace process to address the Syrian crisis. Our capital became a home to the summits of leaders of world religions. The Conference on Interaction and Confidence, Confidence Building Measures in Asia, headquartered in Astana, has become a visible mechanism to address regional and global challenges. For example, we have strongly engaged in tackling the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. I want to underscore the necessity to further increase comprehensive assistance to the Afghan people under the United Nations auspices. In this context, it is important to establish in Almaty a UN regional center for the sustainable development goals for Central Asia and Afghanistan. Kazakhstan has worked hard to maintain friendly relations with our global and regional partners. And we are committed to a growing regional cooperation agenda with our brother nations of Central Asia. Within Kazakhstan, we are making renewed reform efforts to embed principles of justice, rule of law, equality, and fairness. My credo is clearly strong, law and order. This is a solid basis for building just and fair Kazakhstan. In the very short period of time, we have reformed our institutions, curtailed the powers of the presidency, amended our constitution, reset political and economic systems, fought the corruption. So contemporary Kazakhstan is different from what it was, say, two years ago. Our path to overhaul the existing system is far from over. We understand that political reforms and investments in human capital can save us from the middle income trap and make our economy more resilient. Although meaningful transformation has already taken place, there is still much to be done. But we take courage from understanding that to make a successful journey, someone must be ready to overcome plenty of pitfalls. And we are ready for, the, for it. Distinguished guests, of all the challenges we face, perhaps the most existential is climate change. Central Asia is one of its front lines. Even if we successfully limit global temperature rise to 1.5 Celsius by 2050, which looks increasingly unlikely, we will experience between two and two and a half Celsius of temperature rise here in Central Asia. This will transform, or more precisely, uh, desertify and dehydrate our local environments. We must be prepared for greater difficulties. We are really concerned about the scarcity of water resources. Droughts and floods in Central Asia will cause damage of 1.3% of GDP per annum, while crop yields are expected to decrease by 30% leading to around 5 million internal climate migrants by 2050. Our glacier surface has already decreased by 30%. The two great rivers of our region, the Sir Daria and Amu Daria, will lose an estimated 15% by 2050. To prevent environmental disaster in the region, we urge that more resources to be allocated to support the International Fund to save the RLC. Water and climate change are closely linked. Central Asia is a region where water security can be achieved only through close cooperation and efficiently tailored joint measures. To discuss this and other climate-related issues in the region, 
I propose to establish a project office of Central Asian countries in Almaty and to hold a regional climate summit in Kazakhstan in 2026 under United Nations and other international organizations' auspices. My country could offer a tremendous green economy opportunities and finally emerge as a renewable energy hub. However, time is not on our side. To decarbonize and build green e economies at the necessary speed, we need resources and partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, our planet's climate emergency is the clearest example of our interdependence and shared destiny. Whether we like it or not, we are bound together. Given that reality, those who figure out how to work together will succeed, and those who don't will fail. Multilateralism centered in the United Nations, Nations principles and values is not merely the most effective way to address this challenge. It is the only path. These are the principles, the intellectual roots of the Astana International Forum, a space for dialogue to tackle common challenges and move towards cooperation, development, and progress. I am optimistic that constructive discussions in the next two days can begin to move us towards potential solution and further collaboration. Let me end with a gentle warning. To foster meaningful conversation and cooperation, open-mindedness, tolerance, and compromise are required. I wish positive impact for each of you and for this forum. Once again, I thank you for joining us today, and I wish you fruitful discussions. Mr. President. Thank you, sir. One quick question. Yes. You talk about open-mindedness, tolerance, that you ask uh, the delegates and the participants to bring to the dialogue. What, sir, then, is your definition, your vision of success for the forum? Uh, from my perspective, we need to look deeper into the nutshell of problems that we have nowadays, the problems that shadow the livelihoods of human beings. As a matter of fact, the life of ordinary people around the world has become more difficult. We should acknowledge it first. Secondly, we should not look at the headlines. We should go far beyond the headlines to speak about the problems that unfortunately unite us and we need to tackle them. Shortly speaking, from my perspective, dialogue, exchange of views, as you said and I said, open-mindedness should definitely, definitely prevail. The brinkmanship, the ideology of wars and conflicts. That's my mm. Thank you, sir. The President. Open-mindedness, tolerance, dialogue, tackling the challenges. You have your marching orders at one particular level. To continue with this theme, I'd like to invite His Excellency Sarah Jabrov, the President of Kyrgyzstan, who is going to now address us. Sir, if you would like to come and join us. Your Excellency, President Tokayev, participants of the forum, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to all the participants, distinguished 
President Takayev, I would like to express my gratitude to you personally for inviting me to take part in this important event and thank you for the hospitality and high level of, of forum organization. I fully agree with the view of Kasim Jamarat Kimelevich on the need to respond to modern threats through partnership as the key principle of the existing global system. Right now, different regional formats are becoming even more relevant. This gives us an opportunity to see whether we are on the same page and also to talk to the world. Therefore, this intellectual expert strategic platforms like Astana International Forum are becoming even more valuable today. It is my great pleasure to be speaking in front of this distinguished audience, which brings together political leaders, representatives of international organizations, business leaders, community representatives, and leading journalists. I would like to use this opportunity to share my views on the topic of today's event and to share our ideas with the expert community. Distinguished forum participants, we are witnessing the creation of the new global order, which is accompanied by growing threats and challenges in the area of security, uh, which are affecting the whole global community. Let me emphasize some of the issues that we are facing in Kyrgyzstan and all over the world. First of all, climate change and preserving biodiversity. The world is going through globalization processes. The nations and people become even more connected. And digitalization era creates new opportunities for us that the leading thinkers of the past could not even dream of. However, the fact is that the negative impact of climate change is seen in our region in melting glaciers, increasing the frequency of natural disasters, which brings along a lot of risks for social economic development and food security and creates even more costs for us. Therefore, transition to green economy, climate change adaptation, sustainable use of water and natural resources has become an urgent need. Second, water and water resources. Kyrgyzstan pays a lot of attention to water resources and their efficient use. We are implementing the principles of integrated water resources management to achieve social, economic, and environmental goals. We have launched the process of reforming our legislation, including the water code of the Kyrgyz Republic. In February 2023, we've adopted a national water strategy for Kyrgyz Republic till 2040. In the framework of this strategy, Kyrgyzstan is committed to improving the accounting and metering of water resources and monitoring of environmental situation, ensuring quality water supply, sanitation, digital transformation of a common information system for water management, to creating sustainable mechanisms for water resource management and incentivizing rational use of water resources. Creation uh, of the basin management bodies will be done using hydrographical principle. I would like to emphasize the fact that Kyrgyzstan is an upstream country and the same water resources are used by other countries. Therefore, we bear high degree of responsibility for the whole region. Kyrgyzstan 
recognizes the need to cooperate in this area on an equal, fair, and parity basis to take into account interests of all countries of the region. Third, energy. The world is going through a difficult stage of development. Given the scarcity and high energy prices, renewable energy sources are coming to the forefront. Currently, work is underway to select water assets where in the future we could implement the projects for small hydro and medium-sized hydro power plants. In this context, I would like to note that hydro potential of 252 large and medium rivers of Kyrgyzstan is estimated to be 142 billion kilowatt hours of energy, of which we are now using only 13%. The renewable potential is estimated to be 840 million tons of uh, fuel per year. By 2050, our target is to reach carbon neutrality, first of all, through using renewable energy sources. In this regard, I invite all the interested parties to cooperate in the area of renewable energy sources and to conduct investment uh, through various mechanisms, including public-private partnerships. We are creating a reliable system of preferences, and we have taken measures to ensure development of sustainable energy. Fourth point is economy. I think it would be no mistake in saying that it was never as difficult for analysts to come uh, with forecasts as today. We can see more and more emotional words uh, in their forecasts, uh, talking about luck, optimism, unexpected things, and so on. Uh, Kenneth Rogoff, a well-known economist, uh, in the beginning of 2023 has explicitly mentioned in one of his articles that in 2022 the world did not face uh, the system level financial crisis and that was a small mi miracle it's now becoming a common opinion that we shouldn't uh, expect uh, miracles like this in the near future in the economy rather we will see more and more unexpected things in the signs of fragmentation are not as visible in international trade right now, but more and more analysts are now uh, leaning towards the idea that protectionist measures will grow because the geopolitical tensions grow. And for Central Asia, this could have very serious consequences. It is evident that if countries of the region will be isolated from the global market that could lead to reducing exports and worsening trade balances, which in turn means reduction of investments and growing unemployment. Next change uh, in this logical uh, train is also true. If we see growing trends for fragmentation, that means that we will see an increase in geopolitical tensions in the region, we'll see more extremism and possible negative impacts on the ecology. Therefore, we need to strengthen regional cooperation, look for new effective formats for cooperation, and work with various international platforms at the same time. And that should be done not only in the bilateral framework, but we should also act as a region. In this context, I would like to note uh, the uh, speech of uh, President Tokayev at the Eurasian Economic Forum last month, where he, he mentioned as uh, one of the measures of success of economic integration, the creation of new enterprises, uh, technologies, and jobs. Distinguished forum participants, ladies and gentlemen, 
Kyrgyzstan recognizes the importance of global challenges and is ready to make its own contribution to resolution of the challenges. We understand that these challenges require cooperation and coordination by all nations and international community. Given the need to overcome the aforementioned challenges and the need to implement climate and energy uh, projects, so we understand that significant investment will be required. We expect active engagement of our partners, financial institutions that work in the region to ensure transition to a green, sustainable, clean and carbon neutral economy. We need to focus our efforts on conducting coordinated policy on development of uh, transport corridors to create favorable conditions to have access to global markets. Strengthening investment cooperation, especially in the area of digital economy and green development, is especially relevant for uh, the modern day. We believe that all of this will be possible only through coordinated and aligned policy on the regional and international level. Dear friends, in conclusion, I would like to emphasize that only through solidarity and mutual responsibility for the prosperity of our countries and nations, as well as the region of the whole, will we be able to create a fair, safe, and socially oriented development model. Thank you for your attention. Sir, you can hear me. Um, before you uh, sit down, can I just ask you, you talked there about the need and the challenges and the cooperation. So what can the five Central Asian countries do to cooperate better? What needs to actually happen to make it work? Uh, Richard, thank you. I think that uh, you've um, pointed out the important thing uh, in my presentation, the need for regional cooperation. Our region is um, very diverse in terms of opportunities and challenges. On the one hand, we see significant natural resources, uh, significant uh, demographic potential. There are also transit opportunities in Central Asia. These are all the conditions for successful mutual cooperation and development. Our region, I think, is a big geoeconomic space with a lot of transport and logistic potential. And I think that we are building successfully various forms of economic cooperation and coordination. Uh, we are also doing it through uh, platforms like Eurasian Economic Union, through the Commonwealth of Independent States, and also in the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And all of the components of the system, I think, are reinforcing each other. Our region has a strategic location at a crossroad of various civilizations and geopolitical systems. It is like a bridge between Asia, Europe, and Middle East. In this context, I would like to emphasize successful regional platforms like uh, Central Asia plus Russia uh, plus uh, China plus Japan, Korea, US, EU, and India. Uh, we, as representatives of brother nations of Central Asia, take pride in our common history, uh, millennia of culture and civilization. I think that we have a lot in common in terms of customs and traditions. Uh, we have 
uh, similar mentality, psychology, and the world outlook. I think that these are all parts of our common heritage, and it's an important competitive advantage. Sir, please take turn. I'm grateful to you, sir. Thank you. Watch the step. And so we move on. We, the challenges are clear. The solutions are less obvious. The requirement of, uh, to quote both presidents, the requirement of dialogue and I would add courage and honesty to the pr prosecution of that dialogue is crucial, which is why I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Her Excellency Zelika Cianovic, the chair of the Presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, to give us a different perspective and to take us into a different part of the world. Respected Presidents, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, participants. First of all, I want to thank our hosts for their hospitality and the excellent organization of this important event. It is so nice to be here in the beautiful country of Kazakhstan, but it is also very nice and useful to have the opportunity to exchange opinions and views with other participants on some key issues of the modern world. In the past several decades, especially after the Cold War, we have lived in the world of globalization where multilateralism is one of the prerogatives of international relations and actions, not only to achieve cooperation, but also to address various challenges and threats. In this new pattern, all the actors of international relations, be it states or other entities, are strongly oriented towards each other and are highly interdependent. And this is something that certainly never existed in earlier periods of human history. It is quite logical that in such circumstances, multilateralism has become a standard of communication and action in the modern world. And it is also logical that it has created new rules of the game that must be respected by all. But in reality, this is not always the case, which leads to the situation where multilateral structures become a tool or an instrument for realizing the interests and selfish goals of a small number of countries who possess superior economic, political, or military power. And let's be honest to say that some major crises in the world have occurred due to the inability of multilateralism to solve accumulated regional or global problems. The policy of power or force on one side and the policy of democratic multilateralism on the other one represents two opposite mutually irreconcilable poles. We have learned so far that functional multilateralism cannot exist without a proper environment that is a system of multipolar balance of power where no actor or group of actors will be able to impose their own rules and attitudes on others, and where the level of mutual respect and communication is much higher than is the case nowadays. Therefore, in this globalized world, it is necessary to more sincerely return to wider universal platform, while at the same time nourishing all regional forms of cooperation. But evidently, the UN, as the global platform, has encountered numerous problems in fulfilling its own mission and its own, its own basic function. Now it is more obvious than ever that there is no international community as a real collective category. The atmosphere within the global or international frame is too divisive for it to be seen as a uniform collective body. But if we really want to cons consolidate the collective uh, multilateral structures, then it is necessary for certain actors to give up the policy of force. Obviously, international relations are militarized, and in order to overcome such a situation, the concept of dialogue and diplomatic efforts needs to be revitalized. This means individual states must not use or misuse the regional or global structures to impose their own interests on the others. I come from a country which is a perfect example of how multilateral structures have been misused by some countries in order to manipulate the implementation of an, implementation of an international treaty that established peace and constitutional order in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Following the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which lasted 
from 1992 to 1995, and based on the above treaty, the Office of the High Representative was established to facilitate and coordinate some aspects of post-war processes. Contrary to the initial purpose, and by acting beyond their mandate, these foreign diplomats acting as high representatives have turned into rulers who have usurped the competencies of our domestic institutions and have imposed numerous pieces of legislation, amended our entities' constitutions, and even dismissed elected officials from office, all by decree and without any due process. Their continued presence and the powers they illegally exercise have created a situation where Bosnia and Herzegovina is treated as a colony, and still it is the case. Therefore, international structures and organizations must not serve as the playground of the big ones. If we speak about partnership, then it should be partnership for all, not partnership for one or several at the expense of all the others. In the past decades, we have seen many situations where one actor or a group of actors have tried to format the whole world in accordance with their own interests and goals. Great powers, as a rule, behave as superior and act from the position of dominance. Thus, the key responsibility for the current state of affairs in the world and for the fate of multilateralism lies with those who act from the position of power. By doing so, they may endanger and eventually completely ruin the major principles of multilateralism. On the other side, small or less powerful countries are far more ready for dialogue. What we can see within the multilateral structures nowadays is far from shared values or common interests. That is why the international structures and organizations must be redesigned in such a way that they ensure equality of all actors. Sadly, double standards and hypocrisy are part of many multilateral processes of today. The evident failure of the multilateral geopolitical concept does not necessarily mean that we should give up all the forms of multilateralism. It would be very dangerous even to think that international cooperation and multilateral approaches are no longer needed. On the contrary, they are very much needed, but the current multilateral system should be overhauled and re-energized in order to address the complexities of the rapidly changing world. Obviously, a new rational and realistic agenda is needed to gather all the actors together within multilateral structures of future. Otherwise, multilateralism will end up in complete anarchy. And this is exactly what we need to avoid. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Ah. Um, it's going to be sorry? <laughs> it's going to be harder because I have to sit here. <laughs> yeah, I'll just yeah. make sure the microphone is... It's okay. Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Madam President, the, just listening to you there, first of all, how concerned should we be at the rising tensions in your part of the world between some of the countries there? where? skirmishes which are giving rise for concern because they could turn into something far more serious. I think that we should be concerned for several reasons. And one reason is actually that we, we lack some reality or real, realistic approach to all the current issues there. But when we speak about the current issues or current problems, this is not something which is new or something which has appeared recently. Uh, we still deal with the issues that have been present for 25, 30 years. And we, I have to say that there is a huge interference or involvement of the international element in all our countries in our region, in the Western Balkan region. Uh, but that shows also or demonstrates that uh, given the fact that there is high involvement of internationals there and that still we deal with the same problems that obviously the recipe is not good and we have to change the formula. So that's why I'm... I'm just, you know, concerned because, you know, this formula is not changed, you know, in order to suit everyone there and in order to adapt to the needs of everyone there. Right, but the danger and the risk is that the, the, the tensions that are simmering to boiling whilst the rest of the world is preoccupied with Russia and Ukraine and our attention is diverted and that creates opportunity 
and what would you like to see happen? But, you know, there are many hot spots on this planet, you know, and I wouldn't say that uh, the Western Balkan region is something which is a hot spot of nowadays, you know. You wouldn't? I wouldn't say that, you know, but I would say that, you know, uh, if we just continue following the same line without being realistic, without uh, having to understand everyone living in that region, without having uh, this idea of the necessity to approach everyone, you know, without double standards, you know, to have kind of an uniform approach to everyone, then the problem should be resolved, you know. So I don't think it is a kind of, you know, as hot right. spot as some other uh, places uh, on the globe. Okay, so finally, where you see bosnia Herzegovina in this, your positioning, I mean, you, you, you're pretty down on the multilateral uh, process at the moment. Listening to your speech, you're pretty critical of it. So where do you see I'm just You're, being realistic, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, not very critical. I'm just being realistic, not very critical, you know. This is my point of view when it comes to multilateralism, and I understand actually that some things need to be changed, you know, and some rules need to be changed, and also some habits need to be changed in order to, uh, to make it something which will work for all. And I just indicated that, and I gave one example here in my address, and that, for instance, you know, we see some problems in Bosnia and Herzegovina because we didn't see the benefits of multilateralism, but because we right. see some, you know, uh, bad points or bad sides of that. And that, that's why I'm urging, you know, whoever concerned actually that we change the games and to change the rules of the game in order to make everyone happy there. Madam President, I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Now, I think you've got a good flavour there that the challenges are going to be addressed and without fear or favour, people are prepared to discuss the, the, uh, the, the important issues. And with that in mind, I'd now like to, you to watch a short video message from, the, from Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, which is indeed the UN is a strategic partner of the Astana International Forum. Excellencies, I send my warmest greetings to the first Astana International Forum and thank you for your focus on tackling global challenges through dialogue. We are living through trying times. Conflicts old and new greened on. Geopolitical tensions are rising. The climate crisis continues unabated and anger and inequality are increasing. Sustainable Development Goals, our blueprint for peace and prosperity on a healthy planet, are far off track. And every day brings warnings of the dangers of unregulated new technologies. These are all global issues. We can only address them by joining forces and working hand in hand. Today, our collective mechanisms and actions do not match the pace or scale of these challenges. We at the United Nations are working to bring countries together to address these gaps in global governance and find solutions. Our Common Agenda initiative proposes a renewed multilateralism that is fairer and more inclusive, that addresses new risks and threats that will protect our planet for the benefit of future generations. Global leaders must act now to rescue the Sustainable Development Goals, reform an unfair financial architecture, and address common threats at a series of important summits, starting with the SDG Summit in September. Building on these, the Summit of the Future next year will consider how to take forward many of the proposals of our common agenda. And the Astana International Forum provides a new opportunity to discuss these issues and find collaborative, sustainable and innovative solutions for all. I thank you and wish you a successful meeting. The Secretary General of the United Nations. Now, our next guest and speaker, in the old days, and I'm old enough to remember, the IMF was that organization in Washington that really everybody liked to beat up on. I remember vividly, 50 years is enough, was a massive campaign against the fund and the bank. But just as the Astana Economic Forum has changed its stripes to the International Forum, so the IMF has also had to change too, recognizing that you couldn't just look at debt, or you couldn't just look at balance of payments. It had to be seen in the bigger picture. And so today, ladies and gentlemen, if there is a debt crisis, she is there. Inflation and recession, she'll be there too. 
International development and the question of diversification of economies, oh, you can bet she'll be there. And when there's the necessity to remind policymakers of all stripes where they're going wrong, you can guarantee that the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, will be there. Madam Managing Director, please. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are so fortunate to be in Astana for this forum because what we see here is the power of transformation. What Kazakhstan has achieved since independence is truly breathtaking. I, uh, had the chance to tell the president this morning that the IMF is upgrading our projections for growth in Kazakhstan by half a percentage point. So we expect the country this year to achieve near 5% growth. This in the context of the world economy slowing down. Uh, in fact, global growth this year is expected to be only 2.8%. Inflation <laughs> remains high, 7% for this year. And that means that interest rates will have to stay higher for longer. All of this creating a difficult time, especially for the most vulnerable people on our planet. So, when I look at this picture, what I want to share with you that, that worries me the most is that at the time when there are uncertainties, we are still recovering from the scarring from the pandemic, when productivity is not growing fast enough, when poverty is going up and hunger is going up, we collectively are acting unwisely by throwing cold water on what is not a very high heat economy to begin with. And we do so by allowing the forces of fragmentation, some have already spoken about them, to damage the prospects for billions of people to have better opportunities and better lives. At the IMF, we have done a lot of work to assess how big this damage of fragmentation can be. And the numbers are quite staggering. If we allow trade to get into separate blocks, and we do that without any guardrails, any safeguards, the cost to the world can be as high as 7% of global GDP. Just to give you a sense of what it is, 7% of global GDP is equivalent of the German and Japanese economy wiped out from the world altogether, seven trillion dollars of loss. If we add to this technological fragmentation, the cost can go up for some countries up to 10, 12 percent. And when we look at foreign direct investments that more and more follow political alliances rather than a economic logic that cost can go up by another 2%. But we can be wise. We can recognize that both the pandemic and the war teach us there is need for more diversification of uh, global value chains. It, it requires more 
integration that reflects national strate strategy objectives, and yet do that by being more effective and protecting the interests of our people. At the lower end, the fragmentation I talked about can be just 0.2% of global GDP. So let's aim for that, not for the higher uh, rank. Um, I am very concerned that uh, since 2018, various trade and foreign direct investment restrictions have tripled. Well, it is up to policymakers, to us, to counter that and bring more sanity in economic decision making. Richard asked us to talk about solutions. So I'm going to offer four. A pragmatic multilateralism that can deliver benefits for majority of the world's people. One, separate the issues where no country, no region can succeed on its own. The fight against climate change, pandemic, debt, and I would add artificial intelligence. How do we capture the benefits, but be mindful and reduce the risks? Two, recognize that trade among uh, in a, in a, in a multipolar world would be more integrated within regions, within clusters of countries. But do it on world trade organization standards and rules. Plurilateral agreements, deep regional agreements within the WTO uh, standards and rules. Three build guardrails for food, for medicine, no restrictions when we talk about life-saving flows of goods and services. Four, make sure that we don't fragment financially the world, fragment the payment systems in a way that even if we want to integrate no more we can. In other words, make sure that cross-border systems can talk with each other, can interact with each other. And this is what we at the IMF have a duty to deliver to the world. Thank you. Oh. Right. Well. You gave us plenty there to think about. Why should we be confident that any of it can or will be done? You know, um, Nelson Mandela uh, once said, impossible until it is done. We muster the political will, we can do it. And let me say, I am a, a natural optimist, but I also have seen over time, the world raising to a challenge. Remember 2020, March, April, the world economy came to a complete stop. We expected, Richard, depression. We expected the world economy to shrink 10% or even more. That didn't happen. Why? Because central banks, finance ministers, came together, coordinated policy. I am proud the IMF was a platform for this coordination as well. And we prevented a economic catastrophe. We can do it, and uh, President uh, Tokayev tells us how to do it. Talk with each other. All right. Dialogue. Talk to each other in dialogue. On this question of inflation, do you worry in the developed world, once we get down to 3%, say 4%, well, let's not argue about a percent here or there, that we will stop the fight. Do we need, in the US, EU, in the major in the developed economies, do we need to get inflation down to 2% and therefore that'll mean even higher interest rates now? 
uh, we do need to bring uh, inflation down to central bank uh, uh, targets because these targets uh, are there for a reason. Uh, let me say two things on that. First, if we don't put inflation under control, we undermine prospects for growth. And remember, inflation is a tax on the poor. We harm the poorest people in our societies. Two, uh, when we go in that direction, obviously we all have to assess the structural changes that are happening in the world. Greening our economies is not cost-free. Over time, it is cheaper to do it fast, but in the first years, there would be pressure on cost. Supply chains that are built with more slack to be more resilient, that adds to cost. So we might have to think about the cost structure right. of the future with a different eye than, than central bank supplied you, today. You are fortunate. You go around the world, you see economies, different economies. What's the one... What's the one, I say, piece of advice, suggestion, whatever, choose your word, that you would say to the five Central Asian economies for how, to follow on from what I was saying to the president of Kyrgyzstan, how they cooperate together for better economic collectiveness? Well, integrate. The economies uh, take full advantage of your proximity and reform, reform, reform. The world is changing very rapidly. If you don't change at, with the same speed or faster, you fall behind. Uh, we, we know that there is potential here to open up even more space for private initiative. Do it. We know that this is the biggest advantage of this region. People, 60% under 30, make sure that they're skilled and that they have opportunities to, to reach their full potential and do it together. Central Asia, Central Asia can demonstrate to the rest of the world that working together is possible. Managing Director, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so we move on. No stone is left unturned. Our next speaker will give an interesting and different perspective on this idea of working together. May I invite His Excellency Abdullah Aripov, the Prime Minister of Uzbekistan, to, uh, to join us. Prime Minister. Distinguished Mr. Kasim Jomart Kamilovich, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to participate in such an impressive international forum in the capital city of the brotherly Kazakhstan, Astana. Allow me to convey to all participants of the forum the warm greetings of His Excellency, Mr. Shavkat Mirziyoyev, President of Republic of Uzbekistan. This forum, which is being held at the initiative of His Excellency, Mr. Kasim Jomart Tokayev, provides a good opportunity for a broad exchange of views on the most relevant issues. I believe that all the distinguished guests present here will agree that the level and scope of the Astana International Forum fully reflects the progress made by Kazakhstan in recent years. I am convinced that this authoritative platform will become a venue for developing new ideas and multilateral cooperation focused on addressing current and future challenges. Today, the world has entered a period of changes and profound transformations, processes of significant reforms that affect all states and continents, 
without exceptions, are accelerating. We are facing such modern challenges, such as climate change, water and natural resources scarcity, the social and economic consequences of pandemic, the energy crisis, as well as food security crisis, which pose a serious threat to sustainable development. All this adds up to the already difficult situation in the global economy, which is characterized by increased competition over markets, resources, investment and technology. In addition, we are also witnessing the negative effects of disruption of the traditional supply and change that almost all the speakers mentioned today. This also includes the increasing complexity of transport logistics and payments as well as rise in protectionism. In this context, it is more important than ever for all of us to build trust and engage in constructive dialogue. The prime example for partnership and close cooperation in tackling common problem is the Central Asian region. Thanks to the strong political will and consistent action of the region's leaders, a whole new atmosphere of mutual trust has been created in Central Asia over these recent years. This allows us to solve even the most complex regional issues addressed solely through dialogue and reasonable compromise. Important achievements include the opening of borders, the restoration of transport links and the launch of new routes, effective interaction on the use of transboundary water resources, intensification of cultural and humanitarian ex exchanges and much more. In addition, intra-regional trade and investment have increased manifold. Joint investment funds have been established. A number of significant cooperation projects have been launched in many sectors of the economy. Most importantly, our people are already seeing real results from this effective cooperation. By strengthening our unity and cohesion, we are working together to build a stable and steadily developing region and thus a reliable and predictable international partner. At the same time, Central Asia, like other regions of the world, faces the challenges of environment and climate change, transport isolation, energy and food security. Dear participants of the forum, Today, under the leadership of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan, His Excellency Mr. Shavkat Mirziyoyev, our country is undergoing a large-scale reform set aimed at building the new Uzbekistan. They have affected basically all the areas of state and social life. Our reforms are fully in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and they are united by the overarching principle, human interests come first. Our goal is to become an upper middle income country by 2030. Special attention is being paid to effective social protection of vulnerable groups and poverty reduction. Over the past period, we have accelerated systematic reforms aimed at further liberalization of the country's economy, improving the investment climate, supporting of small and medium-sized businesses, developing of high-tech industries, and transitioning to a green economy, especially green energy. The President of Uzbekistan has set a goal to increase the share of renewable energy in electricity generation to 40% by 2030. As a result of the transformation, we have made remarkable progress in diversifying the economy and making it more sustainable. Our country is always open to close cooperation with all the international partners to build 
a prosperous future. Ladies and gentlemen, on this occasion, I would like to invite our international partners to increase funding for the implementation of regional climate projects under the Green Agenda, especially taking into account the consequences of the RLC disaster. To support projects aimed at strengthening transport connectivity between Central Asia and other regions of the world. This includes, in particular, the construction of the China-Kyrgyzstan-Uzbekistan and Uzbekistan-Afghanistan-Pakistan railway lines. To implement joint projects in advanced agricultural technologies, water preservation and food security. To actively promote joint projects to introduce digitalization and innovative technologies in various areas. Dear participants of the forum, in conclusion, on behalf of the delegation of Uzbekistan, I would like to express my gratitude to His Excellency Mr. Kasim Jumart Kemerevich Tokayev, the Honorable President of Kazakhstan, for the high level of organization of today's forum and the traditionally warm hospitality. I wish all participants successful discussions and fruitful negotiations. moment of your time, if you'd like to come and join me, Prime Minister. Um, very interesting. You, you say that the goal is upper middle income by 2030. That's a very ambitious target, uh, and it is good. But how do, you, how do you factor in, how do you put into that the regional integration with neighbors that will give you, that will help you towards that. What do you all have to do in Central Asia? First of all, uh, as far as different opportunities of development of economy in the region, distinguished president of the Republic of Kyrgyzstan already mentioned, Mr. Japarov spoke to that effect. The region has natural resources that are underused and that are in high demand. For example, in relation to the use and the development of green or greener technologies, industry and automobile industry. As for the a development through cooperation of all the countries in the region among themselves. This is already ongoing and I can say that we have a very good work being implemented. A number of projects are implemented, for example, in the area of the automobile industry, electronics, production, textile in Kazakhstan. Or, for example, in Uzbekistan, with the help of our Kazakh colleagues, we're actively developing the area of construction, finance sector, and same goes to other regions. Indeed, what will it take to take this cooperation to the next level. Everybody agrees that there needs to be an increase of cooperation. What will make it happen? Well, we have to work. Let me tell you this, Richard. I just I told you about the fact that thanks to the political will of the head of the states of the region, we have established a dialogue. This is what we're talking about here today. We have a very good dialogue platform. We also have 
an advisory council at the level of heads of state of Central Asia. All the presidents, all five presidents, meet at least once per year and discuss among themselves. Then they meet and discuss some more. And then they give the instructions to the special commission that we have in our countries. We also have the International uh, Fund to Save RLC. Also at the same platform, our leadership meets. We have another platform. It is a unique platform. It is a platform for interregional cooperation. So at all these levels, at all these platforms, we have to implement what our heads of states have agreed upon. That's it. The forum has changed its direction. I made that clear. No longer just the economic forum, but now the international forum. And as that video showed at the beginning, what that means is an increase, a widening of the agenda. And with that in mind, I'm delighted that the Director General of UNESCO is with us, Audrey Azoulay, to come and address us. Ma'am, come forward. Mr. President, Head of State and Government, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I would like to start by thanking Kazakhstan and its, its President for opening this uh, Astana Forum to issues above and beyond economic cooperation. Because international cooperation and sustainable financing of public goods such as culture, science, education are absolutely essential to shape our common future, but also to shape just and sustainable economies and society. And these are precisely the mandate of UNESCO. To present uh, this morning examples of concrete uh, multilateralism, and especially in the region, I will not start by cultural issues, but discuss, present two issues. Uh, the first one was mentioned by many, many of you this morning, and it's the science, scientific diplomacy, and cooperation on a crucial issue like water. Water here in Central Asia, it's of course an uh, aquifer, transboundary resources of water, but uh, especially glaciers, glaciers that are uh, um, uh, towers of water essential for the region. And uh, President Tokayev re reminded us of the tragedy going on right now. In this region, glaciers have shrunk by 30% over the past 50 years due to climate disruption. It happens here in Central Asia, but it happens everywhere in the world. Last September, ahead of COP27, a UNESCO study showed that one third of all glaciers in World Heritage Sites will disappear by 2050. So, so we are faced here with a challenge which is by nature global or regional, as water is very often a transboundary issue. And it's an issue that needs cooperation. So what did we do in UNESCO with the countries of the region in Central Asia to address this issue? First, Together with four states of the region, we've worked since 2021 to better understand through science and prepare for the risk associated with the sudden and deadly overflow of high mountain lakes due to melting of glaciers. It's a vital scientific cooperation that allows 
governments, civil society, to be scientifically informed and take the good decision. To quote the great Kazakh poet Abai, ignorance is lack of knowledge in the absence of which nothing can be achieved. So we have to start by this scientific uh, cooperation. By 2025, we, we aim to map glaciers, snows, and glacial lakes across Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And the second uh, pillar is assessing risk. Together with all the countries involved, we assess the vulnerabilities for at-risk communities. And our third pillar is precisely to develop early warning systems uh, that are necessary to protect the population that are di directly at, uh, at risk. And secondly, also in this uh, scientific cooperation through the multilateral level, which is UNESCO, but at regional level here, I'm happy to announce that we are launching a major project with the five countries of the region, funded by the Global Environment Facility, to gain for the first time and to monitor a regional overview of the whole cryosphere, glaciers, but also permafrost and snow resources. And as this example, I believe, shows, working at the regional and multilateral levels is both relevant because of the nature of the issue and essential if we are to serve the general interest of the population. And we also know that when nature collapses, so do all the cultures that depend on it. And what a better uh, place to measure risk than here in Central Asia, continent with a deep historic culture, uh, whether that means the nomadic cultures or the cultural traditions linked to the mountains or all that we have received from the beautiful history of the Silk Roads in the region with their exceptional diversity. The second example I would like to, to mention uh, this morning uh, has also been uh, mentioned by, by, by a few of you this morning, and it's uh, the technological challenge. It concerns the exponential development of artificial intelligence in particular. It's an evolution which concerns everyone. In recent weeks, we've seen the dazzling progress of generative AI software, such as ChatGPT, developments that have left us astounded, but also uneasy. Because when it comes to such rapid development of technologies, we must be clear-sighted. We must balance their promise, as great as they seem to be, against their potential pitfalls. We must ensure that these innovations align with our values, uh, protection of data, of our privacy, protection against gender bias, or effects like uh, development of misinformation. And we need to be able to trust these new technologies if we are to build digital economies. If we want to have trust, confidence, we need also ethical frameworks. And this we need to have at the global level, because having a fragmented ethical framework means having no ethical framework at all, because of course it's also a competitive field. So we need to be all together in the same ethical framework uh, together. And this is what UNESCO has started to do with its 193 member states. We embarked on this journey in 2019, and I'm very happy that in 2020. One, our member states uh, voted by consensus, so consensus is still something desirable and possible, adopted by consensus the first global ethical framework for the development of artificial intelligence. So these are just two examples linked to UNESCO's mandate, where I believe we see the importance of a dialogue, of course, of uh, multilateral cooperation, and also, uh, as President Tokayev said, that it's maybe for some issues not only a desirable pass, but the only pass. And I think there is no better place than in Central Asia, continent of crossroads, to, to discuss this with you. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Oh. Have a seat now.
Right, okay, so straightforward, blunt question, Oof. right? Um, would you have signed the letter that says AI is an existential threat to humanity? Would you have signed it? <laughs> I wouldn't, but I'm happy that some people signed it and very informed people because it puts our collective attention on the fact that there are possible serious problems that we see already. For instance, on gender bias, it's so obvious, uh, in, uh, embedded in artificial intelligence systems. But for me, the right answer is not to stop research, is not to stop technological development. I don't think it would be good, and I don't think it would be possible, but it is to have this ethical framework implemented at a national level and everywhere. The thing about ethics is it's really good for those who follow it mm -hmm. and those who don't make it difficult because unless everybody's on board, we're in trouble. Absolutely agree with that. That's why we cannot, I believe, leave it to national initiatives. We need the UN to step in. We need multilateral discussions and multilateral, at least, guidelines. What we is that, po is it that is. possible it in is. today's fragmented world? Well, I'm glad we put this normative instrument at UNESCO for adoption in 2021. When we were able, at the beginning, everybody was told me, you know, it's gonna be very difficult. You want to have countries with very different perspectives on ethical values united around a normative instrument. But that's also the strength of the platforms like the UN, where we have all agreed on universal values. And where in institutions like UNESCO, I must say, each country's voice is equal. So we had two years discussions. They were quite difficult in the end, but it worked. Madam, um, thank you very much indeed. I promise you, next time we meet, I'll speak to you in French. I am a product of the English education system from the 1960s and 70s, which basically means I can barely order a meal in a different language. But I'm learning combination of Duolingo and a tutor, promise you. Now, um, the next speaker, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Now, you might justifiably say, oh dear, where is the security and where is the cooperation in Europe, particularly if we look at the current state of events and the current conflict. But that hasn't stopped Helga Schmidt from battling forward, even in the face of such sharp headwinds. Ma'am, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's such a pleasure to join in Astana today for this forum. And let me pay tribute to the President of Kazakhstan for his initiative, for the new focus he has given, and for bringing us together in these challenging times. Now, tackling um, challenges through dialogue, that's actually the core business of the Organization for Security of the OECE. Um, in challenging times. And uh, in this context, let me also recall the key role Kazakhstan has played in the history of the OEC, especially when successfully chairing the organization in 2010. And I still remember the 
Astana Summit here, and its very successful outcome, the Astana Commemorative Declaration, that remains really a relevant document still today. Now, and now coming maybe to the uh, question of our moderator, let me maybe recall that the story of the OEC starts in the midst of the Cold War. We did not begin as an international organization, but rather as a conference that brought together East and West for dialogue. And it was really about avoiding further escalation, about keeping channels open. But also, let me also say that for the OEC, it's been very clear from the beginning that security is far more than military, that the economic dimension environmental degradation, climate change, as well as what we call the human dimension, fundamental freedoms, uh, non-discrimination, freedom of the media, are all essential to lasting peace and, and stability. And in this context, I also want to pay tribute to our OEC High Commissioner for National Minorities, another distinguished Kazakh diplomat, Khairat Abdrakmanov, whose mandate is to uh, de-escalate tensions that include national minorities, which is core business of uh, conflict prevention. Now it's true, we are seeing unprecedented uh, challenges with war back on European soil. Our moderator just uh, uh, referred to it. And last year, I had to close our field missions in Ukraine, but Ukrainian people need our continued support. And this is why OEC projects continue to meet, address the immediate needs in the country, be it humanitarian demining or coping with the environmental consequences of the war, which, as we are reminded with the destruction of the Kharkovka Dam, can be truly disastrous, and where OEC support is now solicited to address the short-term and the long-term uh, consequences. These are difficult times indeed for international organizations. Tensions are high but it's vital to recommit to multilateralism. We just heard the address of the UN Secretary General in line with the UN Charta and the Helsinki Principles. I, I also would like to refer to his new agenda for peace. The OEC is participating in this consultative process, which really puts human dignity at the center and prevention at its heart. And it's also about strengthening the role of regional organizations when it comes to multilateralism. And here, just to say, the OEC remains essential um, in this current environment because we remain the only uh, re uh, security organization where everyone relevant for Eurasian security is around the table. But our work goes beyond dialogue in, 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 in Vienna. We continue to deliver real benefits every day, making a difference for 1.3 billion people, including, of course, here in, in Central Asia. I come from Ashgabat in Bishkek before I arrived here, and I could see this with my own eyes. I know that for Central Asia, the Taliban takeover has created additional challenges when it comes to security and stability. And this is why, and these challenges affect the whole region, and they go beyond, like drug trafficking. But this is why what we do uh, in the OEC, we help with regional cooperation on border security and management. I would very much uh, support what President Tokayev said about the Middle Corridor. I think the, uh, the work we're doing also as OEC to strengthen trade links between the countries uh, in uh, Central Asia to further and to promote uh, integration. The work we do to improve the supply chains between Asia and Europe to ensure food and energy security is absolutely critical. And in this context, we support, for example, ports from the region to become EcoPort certified. I was in Ashgabat a couple of days ago where I had the pleasure to hand over the EcoPort certificate for the port of Tukmenbashi to the president, and later today, I will be able to hand over the same uh, certificate for the port of Kurik. Mm. Connectivity in the Caspian Sea region is, a key, is one of our key projects in the OECE. 
And I'm very happy to say that this also includes the work we do to increase professional opportunities for women, particularly in sectors where they're underrepresented, like the energy sector. There is no sustainable security without bringing women in at all levels of decision making. And to achieve more just societies, which is in a way the precondition for stability, we also need to engage the younger generation to be real agents for change. Maybe one or two more points. I would really like to draw your attention to one of the most heinous crimes of our times, which is trafficking of human beings. I think this is still underestimated. It affects 27 million victims a year. The OEC is playing a leading role in helping countries and organizations to combat this crime by raising awareness, which is very important, but also to make sure that the survivors are being protected. And by, walking, by working with law enforcement agencies, there's almost impunity to these heinous crimes. And last, but of course not least, climate change. Uh, many speakers have addressed it. I consider it the, extent, the existential threat of our times. We are in the OEC not only working with individual states, but we also foster the kind of regional cooperation crucial to addressing a threat that knows no borders, that no country can tackle on its own. And I've seen here this week in Central Asia how immediate the need for uh, cross-boundary water management is. I will take this back with me and this will be reflected in the OEC ministerial climate conference I will host uh, early July in, in Vienna. This is just a snapshot of the work we do, uh, particularly through our institutions and our field uh, uh, missions. The challenges indeed we face are truly great, but I think we'll only be able to address them together. So regional and through regional cooperation, we, I think we can make a difference. Thank you very much. Quick question or two, if I may. Sure. I just want to ask you, I mean, uh, you you know the, um, the, the English nurse who Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Um, how does the OSCE put Humpty Dumpty back together again? <laughs> Bearing in mind, you know, there is now a war, and by its narrowest definition of OSCE, it's, uh, it's broken. I would absolutely contradict that. First of all, yes. Uh, we have consensus principle, like um, other organizations, which is in essence a strength because decisions taken together are very strong decisions. But of course it's also a challenge. But we have found a way uh, to continue our work. I mentioned the work we continue to do in Ukraine at the request of participating states. It's very clear for us, if a participating states request our support, we have to help them. It's funded through extra budgetary support. So it's also important that, um, uh, that um, and, and I made that point, is that everyone relevant to Eurasian security is around the table. So you have North America there, you have Russia there, Ukraine, Central Asia, South Caucasus, European countries. So every Thursday, there is the Permanent Council, 57 ambassadors uh, plus the partner countries come together and, and discuss. This doesn't necessarily mean we exchange niceties. These are very frank discussions but we discuss, we, 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 are, we are around the table. It must be fairly brutal at times. You need sometimes a thick skin. Uh, but, I, I, but I think I recall the fact that we are not, uh, we are not the European Union. I've worked in the European Union for many years. We are not a like-minded organization. We bring two countries together, and that was the origin of the OEC, to bring countries together in the midst of the Cold War that did not see eye to eyes. And, and one of the objectives was, as I said, also to avoid further escalation, to keep the channels open. And then, as you see, with the work we do on climate change, for example, climate change doesn't know any borders, uh, human trafficking, etc., uh, the fight against terrorism, drug trafficking. For Central Asia, it's very much the challenges that actually come from, uh, from Afghanistan with uh, trafficking of drugs, weapons, extremism. So there is a lot of work to do. <laughs> Don't let me stop you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Our final speaker. We have been around the world. We have seen the different challenges from the different ways. Armida Ali Shabana is the Under Secretary General of the UN and the Executive Secretary 
of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, giving us the perspective of a new and connected Asia. Ma'am. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely honored to be invited to address the Astana International Forum and share perspectives from the Asia Pacific region. With more than three fifths of the world's population, the Asian Pacific region has an outsized global impact. Among the members of the group of 20, or G20, world's major economies, eight are in Asia and the Pacific. Yet the region is likewise very diverse, with more than half of the countries being LDCs, least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, or small island developing states. Many of these countries attain self-governance only within our lifetimes while readily affected by economic, environmental, and social changes, these countries have far fewer options to counter such exogenous shocks. There are global and regional issues that affect us all. This is especially true in a world where all aspects our, of our lives are economically, socially, and environmentally intertwined. Economic growth in recent decades has transformed Asia and the Pacific by reducing poverty and raising living standards. The pandemic, as well as disruptions to international supply chains, brought this progress to a standstill and changed the way we conduct our lives. The return to normality since the pandemic resulted not only from national public health initiatives, but also from the sharing of research and development of vaccines, for example, as well as global production and distribution. Through this common experience, we know that national policies must be coupled with international cooperation to reach long-lasting solutions. We know what can be done when attention is placed on our common priorities. Distinguished participants, the Economic and Social Commission for Asian Pacific, or ESCAP, was established in Shanghai in 1947 to facilitate concerted action for economic reconstruction, this post-war, and development of Asia and the Pacific following General Assembly Resolution in December 1946. Our membership has since expanded to 53 countries and nine territories, including the five Central Asian countries joined ESCAP in 1992. We marked our 75th anniversary in March last year, and in May 2022, the Commission adopted the Bangkok Declaration to commemorate this milestone and pursue a common agenda to advance sustainable development in Asia and the Pacific. The resolution celebrated the extraordinary socio-economic progress that lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty in the region that is now home to the world's largest, most dynamic economies its diversity of culture and economic as well as social systems. It also recognized the need to address the outstanding development challenges of persisting poverty and inequalities, vulnerability to shocks, natural disasters, climate change, as well as environmental degradation. Our members pledges their strong support for the Commission's role in confronting regional transboundary and common challenges, and reaffirm their commitment to advancing sustainable development in Asia and Pacific. Through this resolution, our members committed to leave no one behind, put people, including women and girls, at the center of all our efforts, protect our planet from the challenges to our common environment, including climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and natural disasters, develop healthy environments and better manage environmental risks and resources, work together to enhance regional connectivity and to improve digital cooperation, keep markets open, and align public and private financial resources to effectively 
pursue our sustainable development aspiration. To attain these goals, the resolution reaffirmed the commitments set forth in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the partnerships needed to strengthen multilateralism. We will be able to successfully maintain international financial stability, mitigate climate change, attain sustainable development only by working together. And by working together, the realm of possibilities becomes greater. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, each journey begins with a single step. Each one of us has a point of view. We need to identify what we see as issues of common interest and address them first. Building on the confidence developed, we can bridge the remaining differences step by step. With the 2030 Agenda calling for inclusive and sustainable development, member states, together with all stakeholders, must continue to build the confidence and trust necessary for actions to reach our shared goals. We must transcend our immediate concerns and focus on what we can agree on. Only then will our progress match our ambitions for an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable region. I'm confident that this forum will allow us to build the confidence and trust needed to overcome our common challenges. With these words, I thank you very much. Please, have a seat. One quick question to you. I, I liked the way you ended. I, I liked your, your finish because you, you were optimistic in, in, in what you suggested. So I venture to ask you, why? Where does this optimism come from? In the face of such uh, adversity, how do you remain optimistic? Well, the region, yeah, Asia-Pacific region, and including the membership of ESCAP, we have everybody there. We have all P5s. They are extremely uh, active. It's not that they are not active. We have everybody, right? Uh, I, I don't have to mention. Yeah. Yes, so basically the challenge, challenges are immense. Yeah. But uh, we are very pleased to note that we, we are able to bring countries together. Whether it's optimism or not, I don't know. But what we did is, uh, again, member state, yeah, is together, uh, they come together on the common priorities that I mentioned. Do you sometimes want to hit their heads together? Yeah, I mean, because uh, this is our, our uh, direct experience. Uh, yeah. This is what, what we did. This is what we did, yes. Yeah? So we just tackle uh, the common challenges and also leverage, leverage the potentials, yeah across countries, because uh, this is what countries like. They don't like only talk about uh, issues, challenges, problems, but when they see the potentials to address as a solution, then everybody come, come on board. I'm grateful, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so we've come to the end of the plenary session. Make sure you get back to your seat in one piece. And now, as I send you on your way, you see the difference? We have joined the dots. We've shown you that it's not just economics. One bit can't survive without the other. And so I ask you to head out, and, and the afternoon session begins at 2.30. And Mr. President, sir, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for widening the agenda. And most importantly, thank you for reminding us to get on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you.